Thank you for being here to those in person and for those who are live streaming. I will ask our board secretary to take a roll call vote and establish a quorum. Thank you. President Craighead? Here. Member Benitez? Here. Member Lopez? Present. Member Miller? Here. Member Otto? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, we will now have the Pledge of Allegiance led by Dr. Benitez. Please stand, For those of you present in the room, the board appreciates and supports community input at our meetings. During the meeting, there will be time for the public to comment on matters on the agenda and matters not on the agenda. For those who have not already submitted a request, we have provided forms um, with our board secretary. If you wish to speak during the meeting, please fill out a form uh, indicating your name and the agenda item you wish to address. The board has been meeting in closed session regarding matters listed on today's agenda. The board took action on the following items. Item 3.1, the board voted 5-0 to approve a number of public employee appointments. Um, I will now turn it over to Dr. Baker to provide specifics. Thank you, President Craighead. I am pleased to kick off the announcement of promotions that were approved in closed session, starting with the promotion of Mr. Ed Samuels from Director, Principal Supervisor in the Office of Assistant Superintendent Secondary Schools to assume the position of Assistant Superintendent in the Office of Assistant Superintendent Secretary Schools, Secondary Schools. And I will pass to Dr. Ron, is that you? Okay, at this time, we'd like to hear from Mr. Brian Moskovitz. All right, it's my pleasure to announce some um, uh, promotions at the um, high school level. So first up, Daniel Yu, currently Assistant Principal at CAMS to Vice Principal Milliken. Diana Cohn, Assistant Principal Wilson to Vice Principal Wilson. Kelsey Schaefer, Teacher on Special Assignment at Jordan to Assistant Principal at Jordan. Malcolm Turner, Teacher on Special Assignment at Lakewood to Assistant Principal at Milliken. Alexandria Moreland, Program Facilitator at Cabrillo, to Assistant Principal Milliken. Samson Will Safotu, Counselor in the Secondary Office, to Assistant Principal Wilson. Cheryl Duffelmeyer, Counselor Secondary Office, to Head Counselor Cabrillo. And Jennifer Prager, who is a Program Specialist in Expanded Learning Opportunities, will become an Assistant Director in Expanded Learning Opportunities. Thank you, and now for elementary and TK-8 schools. Mr. David Zaid. We have Jasmine Willis-Thomas moving from program specialist with ELOP to administrative assistant, office of the assistant superintendent, elementary and TK-8 schools. Thank you, and Dr. Christopher Lund. OCIPD. I am pleased and to celebrate and recognize the following promotions within OCIPD. Jennifer Crockett from Program Specialist to Assistant Director. Kimberly Irons from Program Specialist to Assistant Director. Melissa Stark, current Program Facilitator at Newcomb Academy to Program Specialist in OCIPD overseeing our SPED curriculum team. Michelle Torres, t teacher on special assignment within OCIPD to program specialist overseeing our elementary math curriculum team. And Jamaica Ross, teacher on special assignment within OCIPD to program specialist overseeing our elementary ELA curriculum team. Thank you. And Dr. Claudia Sosa Valderrama with School Support Services. Right, good afternoon. Um, so I'm happy to announce the following promotions. Lauren Bowman from Teacher on Special Assignment, Office of School Support Services to Administrative Assistant. 
Office of School Support Services, and Carrie DeLeon, Teacher on Special Assignment, Office of School Support Services, to Administrative Assistant, Office of School Support Services. Okay, into our last uh, round of promotions for Dr. Tiffany Brown. Thank you, good evening. I'm pleased to recognize Dr. Pamela Lovett, moving from Program Specialist in the Office of Deputy Superintendent to Administrative Assistant for the Center of Black Student Excellence. All right, thank you. That concludes our promotions for this month and they will be posted on our website at 515. President Craighead, we may have promotees in the audience if you would like to recognize anyone who's here. Yes, if you were mentioned in those uh, promotions or uh, admin changes, we'd like to recognize you at this time, so please stand. <laughs> Mr. Samuels. Thank you, <clears throat> uh, and congratulations to everyone. So moving on to the report um, on item 3.2, the board voted 5-0 to dismiss a certificated employee and 4-0 with Ms. Lopez abstaining to release a certificated employee. Regarding item 3.3, the board voted 5-0 to expel student ID number 7082 in compliance with Education Code section 48915C1. The student will be eligible to apply for readmission after the end of the fall semester of the 2024-25 school year. The board also voted 5-0 to readmit three students with ID numbers of 0342, 2510, and 3339. Regarding student ID number 30052, the board voted 4-1 for readmission with Ms. Lopez in dissent. On item 3.4, the, bo the board voted 5-0 to approve settlements in the three workers' compensation cases that are listed on the agenda. And finally, on item 3.6, the board uh, agreed by a vote of 5-0 to approve a settlement agreement in the case listed on the agenda. Uh, and now we will go to adoption of the agenda. Move to approve. Second. Discussion? I'll ask our board secretary to take a roll call vote. Thank you. Member Lopez? Aye. Member Otto? Aye. President Craighead? Aye. Member Benitez? Aye. Member Miller? Aye. Thank you. That passes 5-0. Thank you. Um, this is the, this is the not so fun part when it's uh, summer and school is out and we don't have a student representative so we uh, skip that part and go right on to the next thing. But um, I graduated from UCLA, President uh, Craighead. I can <laughs> take on those responsibilities. <laughs> <laughs> and you performed very, very well. I'm experienced in that. Uh, but we do have retirees to recognize. So um, tonight we have three retirees. We will say a few words about each retiree and then they will be uh, presented with a certificate and have a moment to comment. And then after we, re after we recognize all the retirees, then we'll take time to um, have them come one at a time, shake hands, and we'll do pictures. So we'll call you up, and then you'll have a moment at the podium, and then after all three are recognized, then we shake hands and do pictures. Okay, so um, Mr. Miller, I think we'll have you start us out. Yes. So I have the esteemed privilege of honoring uh, our favorite counselor on the west side, Ms. Luz Romero. Please come up to the microphone. So she has been in our district for 31 years and is retiring from Cabrillo High School. 
The Long Beach Unified School District recognizes you for your dedicated service in transforming students' lives as an educator, high school counselor, and head counselor. Your unwavering support and care has helped students achieve prestigious scholarships, success in AP honors, and college courses, with many inviting you to their graduations as a testament to your lasting impact. The other thing that makes you so special is making learning enjoyable while setting high standards for everyone you work with. Your consistency and ability to go above and beyond for your students, colleagues, and community <laughs> to ensure everyone feels seen, heard, and supported. Please accept this certificate in recognition of your 31 years of dedicated service to the Long Beach Unified School District and your lasting contributions to the lives of thousands of students. Thank you so much. It's been a wonderful 31 years. I'd like to thank um, the staff that I work with, teachers, counselors, and I'm sorry for jumped up. And more importantly, the students. I adore the students and their families. Sorry. And my family's watching from Arizona. There's two little ones, Noah and Reagan watching, so hi. Um, I'd like to advocate for counselors. It's been a tough job, I do love it, but um, our caseloads are crazy high and our duties as assigned cripple us sometimes from helping our students. Social workers are doing an amazing job, but they do not have duties as assigned, additional duties, so I beg you to please help us out. Help us make more of a difference to our students that we've been doing for so long, thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Otto. I have the pleasure and honor of introducing Deborah Drab. If she would come forward to the microphone, please. <laughs> Ms. Drab is retiring after 40 years of service as a science teacher at Teacher Tincher uh, Elementary School. Um, your exceptional dedication as a science educator consistently going the extra mile to research and review current su subject matter and methods. You create engaging hands-on lessons that deepen students' understanding and your commitment to the robotics program at Tincher, working um, uh, with students after school every week highlights your, un your unwavering support for their interests and progress. Your remarkable ability to organize and deliver science content with a deep understanding of the subject matter, content standards, and curriculum uh, frameworks. You diligently collect and analyze student performance data to guide your instruction and your innovative system for assessing and documenting students' classroom behavior each week and have been invaluable to your colleagues and students alike. You have instilled a passion for science, preparing students to work, to become the science professionals of tomorrow. Look out world, you've still got a lot going on, going ahead of you. Please accept uh, this certificate of, uh, for, your, for, for your 40 years of dedicated service to the Long Beach Unified School District. Congratulations.
Working for Long Beach has given me some wonderful opportunities to do lots of different things. And um, over the years, I've worked with many, many incredible teachers and a whole lot of awesome kids. So thank you very much. And Ms. Lopez. Yes, and I have the honor of acknowledging Patricia Thompson. And Patricia, Patricia, please come forward to the microphone. And Patricia is retiring as a senior technology support representative. She's worked in LBUSD for 16 years. And the Long Beach Unified School District recognizes you for your outstanding collaboration with your team and constant communication with remote, remote support to ensure high priority issues are resolved efficiently, your dedication to training new team members and your involvement in creating essential documentation have been invaluable. Your exceptional customer service, always ready to help via phone or email, and your commitment to improving first call resolution rates, your leadership at LBUSD, uh, service desk, sorry, especially during challenging times, and your proactive approach in embracing new technologies and training have greatly elevated our IT support to a world-class level. Please accept this certificate for your 16 years of dedicated service to LBUSD and your last lasting contributions to the lives of thousands of students. Um, actually, it's been a pleasure, and, uh, a privilege, and my pleasure working for Long Beach Unified School District. And I'm not going to call it work because it's not work when you love what you do. And I want to say thank you to my Tisby family, who have been nothing but supported and supportive and provided a great work in my environment. And I'm going to miss you guys all. Thank you. At this time, I'll ask our retirees to come forward and we'll do pictures um, right out front. So we'll take a little pause to do that.
Okay, next I'll direct your attention to the screens. We have um, <coughs> a video to watch. El aprender inglés para mí pues, siempre ha sido mi objetivo principal en este país. Bueno, aparte de mejorar de vida, de superarme, la, uno del, el objetivo más importante es aprender inglés, ya que me gusta conocer gente de todo el mundo. Te facilita el poderte comunicar con las personas a donde quiera que vayas. Me ha ayudado bastante porque me ha abrido oportunidades de trabajo aún más de las que tengo ahorita. Las clases nunca son monótonas, siempre hay algo distinto, pues. Es una escuela de muy buena calidad. Digo, he estado en bastante escuela de inglés y realmente es que esta se lleva por, por mucho en las otras escuelas. Cuando recién entré a mi trabajo no, no, no les entendía de lo que me querían decir, so por eso vine a esta escuela. Ya he aprendido con el tiempo y ahorita ya me, se me facilita un poco hablar con ellos. Te abren muchas puertas y te facilita más estar en convivencia justo con los nativos de habla inglesa. Este, le recomendaría estas clases para convivir, para tener confianza en ellos mismos al hablar, al desempeñarse en sus labores diarias, en sus labores cotidianas. Me, le recomendaría mucho este tipo de, de escuelas y por supuesto este tipo de clubes. It's really nice to see what's happening around the district. Um, and now, if the retirees would like to go, this is a good time. Thank you for being here. I know, good timing. Um, you're welcome to stay with us, but we understand if you'd rather celebrate. Um, yeah, they had one foot out the door already. Yeah, <laughs> just wanted to extend the uh, permission, invitation, yeah. Uh, let's see. So uh, next on the agenda is um, public testimony. We, uh, I don't believe we have anybody to speak on. I or yes, yes. on not off. So we have um, three people to speak on the. Um, okay, so we'll start with uh, Ray Porter. Good afternoon. Last time I was up here, I was retiring in 2018 after 34 years at Poly High School. I'd like to just acknowledge uh, Dr. Jill Baker and the board. Just thank you for this opportunity. These would be the, the best three. I live in Victorville. I come down to see my, my grandkids and my son a lot. But this is going to be the best three minutes I've ever came down through, that, <laughs> through, that, through the Cajon Pass. <laughs> I'd like to acknowledge uh, Coach Don and his wife, Phoebe. And uh, just would like to say that Coach, Coach Don Norfolk, class of 64, Long Beach Poly, started coaching at Poly in 74. And I'm sure the board have his bio, I have read his bio. I'd like to thank a few people very quickly. Co Coach Ron Alice, who coached at Poly and at USC for 20 years. Dee Andrews, Earl Parker, Maurice and Sue Anderson, uh, Jay Camarino and, and two very special people, Bill Salas, who helped see this all the way through from the initial beginning, and then Greg Mendoza, who was incredibly awesome, the former Jordan principal, and getting this done. Just to, just to reiterate, just really quickly, because I'm looking at that clock, Don is the, is, is the only coach, and only high school coach in the United States of American history to have won both National Track and Field Coach of the Year and National Football Coach of the Year, which was nominated by the NFL. No other coach in the history of American high school sports have won both of those awards. He's been elected to seven Hall of Fames, including the CIF Hall of Fame. He's had a documentary produced on him that was narrated by none other than poly graduate Snoop Dogg. Don is mentioned in Denzel's Washington book. It's a book on mentorship. It's called A Hand to Guide Me. The only book that I know that Denzel have written, or had written, and Don is in that book. And he's won 43 championships, 19 state championships, 
and T4 CIF championships, and no one else in California has come even close, probably not in America. He is strictly an incredible person. Don's most notable attribute, in my opinion, is his humility. He's humble to a fault, and truly, he's worthy of this honor, and truly, it's not just a poly honor, it's not just a, a more league honor, but this is an honor that the whole state of California can be proud of to have a man like Don Norfolk represent this city. It's not just a poly award, it's a state award, but we at poly and in the more league, we celebrate Don Norfolk to the highest, and thank you so much. <laughs> Well, thank you for making the trip to, to let us know about all that. Thank you. Um, next, we have Lilia Ocampo. Do I see Lilia? Oh, there she is. Good afternoon, uh, Dr. Baker, uh, board uh, members, and staff. Um, my name is Lilia Ocampo and uh, I am a mother of two recently graduated from uh, middle school uh, and also a Long Beach Education Connection member. And first of all, I want to um, thank everybody for their efforts and uh, getting those students to graduate uh, and also to do your best to get them the equity they need, the services they need to thrive and to get uh, to college and more. Um, as a mother of uh, students that have uh, graduated before uh, from LVUSD and going to college, going to university, to uh, getting their masters and one of them their doctorate. Um, I want to applaud all the fathers that for the efforts they put onto their kids to send them to school, ready to learn and to get the most of what they have available for them and I'm here to also ask you to make sure that the LCAP uh, include the services that all students needed, need to reach and their potential because all students are smart. All students can learn and do good, go to college, but they need the right tools because not everyone learns the same. Uh, in my case, I have a son that is in special education and a daughter that even though she has a um, diagnosis of autism, she is doing really good in comparison with my son that needed more support. And I would like my son to have the same or best opportunities if he gets the services he needs. So please uh, make sure that English learners, black students get the services so they are not an statistic and read on the dashboard because that's what that read it is reflecting. Students that are not reaching their potential, they are not excelling because they need more help than others. Um, and thank you for listening, and I hope uh, you do right for us, our students. Thank you. <laughs> and the last speaker is Nicole. Good afternoon, uh, board members and, and everyone else. My name is Nicole Gon Ochi. I'm with Public Advocates, um, and I support uh, various organizations, parent leaders, and student leaders and educators here in Long Beach. 
Um, I'm here to talk about the LCAP again. I was here two weeks ago. Um, I want to just point out two concerns I have with the narrative around the LCAP. And the first is while I understand and agree that it's a complex and compliance driven document, um, it does not preclude the district from including a comprehensive plan. Instead, it actually encourages alignment between various funding sources and makes it possible to differentiate between LCFF and other sources of funding from federal, state, and local. So I'm confused by the district's insistence to take out anything that is not funded by the LC by LCFF, including tutoring and many of the other long-term English learner supports. I ask that you put it in the LCAP so that everyone in the community can see your full plan to close equity gaps and accelerate learning. Who does it serve to not do so? Second, while I appreciate all the metrics designed to shine an equity flashlight on the problems, this is only helpful if you are proposing a solution. And in fact, you are legally required to provide a solution and not just metrics. So let me just focus on one student group just as an example. English learners are in the red for graduation. According to the LCAP, only 59.5% of English learners graduated in Long Beach. That's terrible, actually. It's uh, the lowest graduation rate of any group in Long Beach. It's 26.5% below non-English learners in the district. And statewide, the graduation rate for English learners is 73.5%, which is signif significantly higher than what it is for English learners here in Long Beach. And so you have, you know, shown an equity flashlight on that, but what is the solution? According to the LCAP, the proposed solution is EL coaches and curricula specialists that provide training to school sites to address EL needs. But these are the same strategies that have been employed since the last three-year LCAP, which resulted in these very sad graduation rates. So what is gonna be different moving forward? If there is gonna be something different moving forward, then that is what should be answered in the LCAP, and that's what it fails to do. So there are many things that could be done. Counselors could play an important role in ensuring that English learners are on track and stay on track to graduate. Other districts have bilingual English learner counselors to support their multilingual learners. Um, but I don't see any of that reflected here. I don't see anything different from the last LCAP. And so board members, it is your responsibility and your role to hold the district accountable for equity among other things. That's why you have the power to adopt the LCAP and budget and the power to say no. So before you say yes, I encourage you to look at whether there's actually equity solutions and not just equity metrics in this LCAP. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we have uh, no one to speak on items not listed on the agenda. Okay, that's correct. All right, so now we have reports on the superintendent advisory groups. We'll start with the business budget and policy development. Uh, Dr. Benitez. Thank you, Madam President. Nothing to report on specifically for today, um, but I did want to highlight that um, parents, guardians, students, and staff uh, of our district um, may have received an email last Wednesday with some district updates, um, actualizaciones in Spanish, um, regarding non-discrimination statement um, and specific board policies, um, like a sexual harassment policy, non-discrimination and harassment insurance letter, and uh, policy for married, pregnant, parenting students. Uh, so these are just examples of the kinds of policies um, that we act or take action uh, on in our district. And so um, I'm wondering as a, as a thinking uh, Dr. Baker uh, item, um, whether we have the ability to send ongoing uh, updates on policies. Oftentimes they're in our consent calendar, uh, in our uh, superintendent's advisory group. Um, we do discuss policy, uh, we bring revisions uh, and updates uh, on an ongoing basis. So I think it would be important for our community members to know um, sort of what policies are coming down the pipeline, what policies we've taken action on, and to find maybe a centralized location on our website. It doesn't necessarily have to be at every board meeting, but maybe quarterly or bi-monthly uh, updates. Because I, 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 as a parent in the district, received the communication. And on the one hand, I thought, oh, this is awesome. But on the other hand, it was sort of, oh, I haven't really seen 
uh, this before. So I know there were some reasons why this communication, um, you know, needed to go out last Wednesday. So just putting it out to my colleagues, to you, Dr. Baker, our, our thoughts of doing this on a more ongoing basis and then finding a place on our website uh, where if someone wanted to see what are some recent policies or for this academic year uh, that were passed or adopted, um, that we could do that as well. We'll look forward to bringing back some ideas to the advisory group that you could you could discuss. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Next, we have the instruction and student learning supports. Sure. Thank you. Um, we discussed the P courses in middle school and the revisions that were made to incorporate the ELA content standards into the P curriculum are now supporting the domains of reading, writing, listening, and speaking. And we also discussed the new World History ELD course at the high school level. And uh, this new course is designated, uh, I'm sorry, designed to support English learners in grades, uh, in 10th grade with designated ELD incorporated into world history, um, into the world history curriculum. Uh, we also discussed the uh, state seal of biliteracy and the state seal of civic engagement. And uh, this year, 816 students met the criteria for the state seal of biliteracy and 188 students uh, met the criteria for the new state seal of civic engagement. And finally, we discussed the implementation of Proposition 28. Uh, and so LBUSD hired 58 certificated visual and performing arts teachers and 115 part-time <coughs> classified coaches and aides. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, workforce development, was there a report today? Uh, no report, just kind of a, a just a quick uh, pat on the back, I'll call it, as uh, we talked about a couple of uh, people who were promoted today, and I'm happy to report that all of those people, if I'm not mistaken, were part of our pipeline programs. And so uh, that's just another sign of the great professional development opportunities that the district has provided uh, its employees, and uh, I look forward to more, hearing more of those opportunities being created as I think that is an uh, important piece to any successful system. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda, we have our consent calendar A. So Move for approval. Second. Discussion? Yes. So I got a couple of things that I wanted to bring up. One in particular is item 13.9 and the naming of the track over at Polly and Mr. Don Norfolk. Um, I'm just so happy that we were able to get that done as uh, uh, Coach Don is a legend uh, in Polly, really uh, in Central Long Beach. And so um, all of the young men and young women uh, that he was able to work with during his tenure um, who have left not only an impact here on our city in regards to the uh, record books, but also uh, the mentorship and the support that he brought to them. Uh, when you know, when we talk about our Poly High School, uh, there's a lot of prestige that comes with being a student at Poly, right? Especially academically, um, but we can't ignore uh, the, their sports and what they've done from football to track and field, and so a lot of the uh, prestige and uh, let's say sticking your chest out that a lot of people have gotten to do by being graduates of Poly is because of some of the hard work that <coughs> Coach Don has done behind the scenes to make sure that they continue to pump championships out over there, man. And so I just wanted to personally thank him for all of his hard work and his support uh, to our city as uh, I got to see some of that firsthand because Polly kicked our butt every year. Uh, any further discussion? Uh, and I also had uh, one more item, and it was on uh, 13.5. My apologies here. It was uh, a donation of $10,000 by the Roosevelt, Roosevelt Parent and Teachers for a Better Education. I just wanted to thank them for their support. Very uh, nice. I, too, on 13.5. The Newcomb Academy Foundation is donating a total of 144840 to the school. 
So kudos to the foundation. Thank you for your hard work and support. And then I'm just wondering um, how LBUSD can help uh, schools, especially underserved schools, maybe start a foundation and replicate what is happening at Newcomb in other parts of the city and other schools. Um, so I just kind of wanted to send my kudos and, and kind of put that out there. Um, on item 13.7, the contract for $112,000 with Continental Interpreting Services. So I do know we have um, support staff that helps with translations. Are we in need of additional staff um, or is this services contract going to support maybe other languages other than th those offered by the district? When we have an additional item come forward like that, it's for both reasons. It's for overage of support and also for some of the less frequently um, sought languages and interpretation. Thank you. And then one more uh, question, and this is uh, for clarification on 13.10, on on the policy 5131.4 on bullying. Um, so when a student has been the victim of bullying, and they request a transfer, the superintendent or the designee sh allows, shall allow for the transfer. Um, and I think it's just a question of really for the public is uh, if, if at any point a family is looking for, to request a transfer, where do they seek this transfer from? Is it the principal, the counselor, the district? And that's on the, the policy. And I yeah, that, that always starts at the school level. Okay. And usually it's the administrative team, which could include the counselor or the principal. Um, and then it's it depends on the level in terms of how that placement is made. At the secondary level, there's an analysis of a, their course sequence. At the elementary level, space availability at the grade level. But it does start at the school level. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, first, uh, acknowledgment of. Uh, Item 13.11, big that we're taking action on tonight. Big congratulations to the 5,039 uh, graduates um, in our district. Um, and a couple uh, follow-up questions from our instruction report, item 13.4. Um, so we have um, proposed revisions to our sixth, seventh, and eighth grade PE courses. Just wondering, uh, background, I know there was a description for those courses, but just sort of what was the uh, catalyst for us uh, updating, revising our PE offerings. This is part of a standard operating procedure to go back through our courses and see which ones need updating based on the new standards and the new frameworks. So this was an opportunity to incorporate the ELA standards into our content areas outside of ELA. This is pretty common in history, science, and the technical studies, which would include PE, to basically utilize those courses as part of content literacy for, for students, knowing that Reading, writing, listening, and speaking is a huge part of disciplinary work. So it's really an, an opportunity to support those skills within our physical education program. Thank you, and maybe this one's for you uh, as well, Dr. Lund. So notice uh, two SPED courses, functional academic, uh, academic courses, one US history course and one medieval history uh, course. Again, just background on you know, why now and sort of yeah, so these are courses that um, is, are intended to essentially replicate the general education coursework that our students experience within our functional academics program so that students have parity in what they have access to. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion? Uh, I just wanted to add my support to the renaming of the Poly High School track in honor of Don Norford. Um, as a recovering track athlete from a long, long time ago in the city of Long Beach, I've been on that field a number of times, and uh, uh, Coach Norford has been a legend in the city of Long Beach, but I didn't even realize how much of a legend he was until Ron Alice sat me down a couple months ago and said, you, we've got to do this. This is so important, and this man has done so much for this community, and everybody knows it, and he needs to be recognized at Poly High School, and so I am 100% committed to that. Congratulations, everybody who will go to that track in the future to celebrate all the uh, more league CIF championships, even state championships this year. Uh, uh, <coughs> That, that we've had in, in the past and that you have been a part of. 
uh, will remember it now as the Don Norford track. So congratulations. Well, let's take the vote and make it official. Um, I will ask our board secretary to take a roll call vote. Thank you. Member Lopez? Aye. Member Otto? Aye. President Craighead? Aye. Member Benitez? Aye. Member Miller? Aye. That passes 5-0. Thank you, and thank you, everyone. <laughs> um, Mr. Mr. Norford, since you're here, can you stand up and we can give you a proper uh, round of applause and maybe even a standing ovation? I have to say it feels really good to do something so wonderful for somebody so deserving. So thank you for being here. But we do understand that you may prefer to go celebrate, so <laughs> don't feel as though you need to um, stay. But once again, congratulations. Um, let's see, and next on the agenda, we have our consent calendar B. Move approval. Second. I'd like to, out of abundance of caution, I will recuse myself from consent calendar B, item 15, as I have a potential conflict of interest under state law. Thank you. Um, any further discussion? Um, I'll and, ask. Oh. And I apologize. I said 15. It's actually item 14. So let me say that one more time. Out of abundance of caution, I will recuse myself from consent calendar B, item 14, as I have a potential conflict of interest under the state law. Okay. Uh, any further discussion? I will ask our board secretary to take a roll call vote. Member Lopez? Aye. Member Otto? Aye. President Craighead? Aye. Member Benitez? Aye. And Mr. Miller? Member Miller, you abstain? That passes 4 0. Thank you. Next on the agenda, we have a staff report uh, with student outcomes, iReady goals one and two. I'll get us started, uh, President Craighead, as okay. uh, Dr. Madrigal joins us. So as we continue on our journey this year on our board goals that were adopted back in November and the progress monitoring calendar aligned to that, um, we're excited to be able to bring you an update as we wrap up the end of our school year with an update on board goals one and two. So Dr. Madrigal. Good evening, President Craighead, board members, Dr. Baker, senior team members, and Long Beach Unified community. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide an update on our board goals. Um, as you recall, we have been providing several updates throughout the year, and um, I'd like to just review the board goals. Um, and as you can see the visual, you have all your four goals as well as a Board of Education guardrails. And today's focus is actually uh, monitoring goal one and two. And just as a refresher, we wanna make sure that we review the definition so that we have an alignment in terms of our thinking around the terms. And this, uh, we've gone over board goals, interim goals, and leading indicators today. Specifically, we're going to be looking at one of the leading indicators, which is the iReady data. So let's start with goal one, reading proficiency. So goal one states the percentage of grade three students who meet or exceed grade level standards on the state English language arts SBAC assessment will grow from 48% in June 2023 to 70% by June 2028. So again, our leading indicator that we will be looking at today is iReady uh, placement. And we're going to take a look at actually diagnostic three. Uh, the next visual provides just um, information again on our targeted cohort. It gives you kind of that visual around who are we going to be looking at every year. We had an opportunity earlier in the year to look at our TK cohort. Uh, we will be looking at FIRSA data as well as SBAC data later in the summer when it becomes fully available and we will provide an update on that data. Um, and when we look at goal one reading proficiency, for today's uh, presentation, as mentioned, we're going to look at iReady, but we're going to look at grades one, two, and three. 
and we have our diagnostic calendar. Um, just to make a note, last year we gave the diagnostic three at the end of the year, and this year we gave the diagnostic three in March. And so I will reference that data point later in the presentation as we start getting into the details around diagnostic three. So sharing a little bit of information regarding um, iReady placement for grade one, two, and three, uh, diagnostic three, at diagnostic three, more than half of our students in grades one, two, and three were on or above grade level. So when we think about the monitoring calendar and we think specifically about when the window, uh, when we provide diagnostic three last year compared to this year, uh, this year in March, students took diagnostic three. And so I wanted to share an important data point that um, this is very promising to see that we didn't change uh, the assessment. The assessment is still looking at what students should know at the end of the year. So this data is very promising because it's showing that with, we were at 70%, 75% of instruction and more than half of our students in grade one, two, and three were met or exceeding um, in terms of that grade level. So th those are some really good highlights in terms of us being able to look at where our students are and um, again, it's uh, diagnostic data. And so something to note about diagnostic assessments are that they're not summative. It just gives us information on where our students are to help us uh, make decisions on how we can address the data, um, where we need to look closely to support students, as well as in this case, looking at areas that we saw some growth compared to last year. Now we're going to move on to great, uh, goal two, which is reading acceleration. Goal two, reading acceleration states, the percentage of students in grade four through eight scoring at the not met achievement level in the prior year who meet the scale score growth target on the state SBAC English language arts assessment will increase from 28% in June 2023 to 60% in June 2028. We are looking at iReady data because our SBAC data, we will review that data later um, in the summer when it becomes fully available. So when we're looking at our iReady, our iReady Diagnostic 3 data, we're specifically for this goal looking at our students who did not meet on SBAC last year. So that is our leading indicator. And so what you see in front of you is really our group from last year. So when you think of who were those students last year, the students that we're talking about were our third graders last year and this year, these are our fourth graders. So fourth graders that took iReady Diagnostic 3 through um, uh, eighth grade. So think about it in terms of fourth through eighth grade. So in terms of sharing the data in, in regards to iReady end of year growth for our students that did not meet on SBAC, we did see some positive changes in regards to that data. We saw that students that scored at the not met last year on SBAC, at Diagnostic 3 this year, 26% um, met growth target compared to last year who only met 15% growth targets. So that was an increase of 11% overall. And as you can see by grade level, you can see that there were positive um, growth targets that were met at each of the grade levels. Now when we disaggregate the data and we look across our groups, we notice that um, in 2020, 23, 24, the growth gap was actually reduced across all our groups this year. Um, so if you take a look at last year's data compared to this year, um, for example, we are noticing that there were positive uh, gains in each of our subgroups. So that's um, really important to note because when we're thinking about what we're doing in our system, and that was something, a conversation in our department, we really looked at like, what could be the possible why? What was different? Because we want to also look at what are the practices that might be different in our system. And so when we looked at data across, we made some inferences regarding this data. And of course, once we look at our summative data at the end of the summer, early fall, we'll be able to correlate some of the inferences perhaps. So in looking at some of the um, inferences and data, we thought about some of our approaches in regards to data. 
So one of the things that we uh, thought about was, for example, structures that have been put in place this year, such as that collaborative data study where schools are collectively looking at some of the data together, as well as the quality core visits where we're walking classrooms as with different lenses, whether it was with certificated, classified, and having conversations around uh, making um, sure that we're looking at the work and it's very visible. So uh, looking at quantitative and that qualitative data. So that is what our team and research is currently looking at, not just the data points that are coming up through the diagnostic assessments, but also those possible like the whys. What are the changes in our system that are helping us in terms of making, uh, moving in this specific case, moving our students out of that not met closer to the met or exceeding. I'm gonna pause there for any questions that you may have. I don't have a question, but I have a comment. I just want to highlight the fact that um, this year, the same percentage of black, African-American, Hispanic, and Pacific Islander students met the growth target, as did white students. I think that's worth really highlighting. Yes, absolutely. So thank you, Dr. Madrigal. A few questions uh, for me or from me, I should say. Um, first is on goal one uh, slides that you shared. Um, let me see here. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll take a word uh, that you used. Uh, you described some of the data as promising. Could you talk a little bit more as to um, what we're using as a gauge to determine whether it's promising you know, how, how mm -hmm. this data looks relative to our interim goals, given that uh, our interim goals are I-Ready specific, but our summative goals are SPAT specific. So can you just kind of re refresh our minds as to what we're looking for to um, think of the data as promising? Sure, so I'll, I'll speak to first, your first question, which mm -hmm. is around promising. Mm -hmm. um, when I say promising, it's promising because going back to that diagnostic window last year compared to this year. So we're talking about last year at the end of the year, students took the diagnostic three. And this year, students took the diagnostic three in March. So that's, there's a difference between instruction that has been given. And so if our students scored, um, we saw a like growth and moving in the right direction at 75% of instruction this year. That's positive and that's promising. That's our, you know, that's promising because imagine if they took the diagnostic three at the end of this year. Now, I say that also with referencing the diagnostic is a diagnostic assessment. It's not summative. So although we would like to see where do they end at the end of the year, right? that's not the intent of that assessment but the data is very promising because it shows us that there was growth other things that contribute to that and we've mentioned that in in prior presentations has been some of our practices that have changed our professional development that teachers have received and the collaboration across departments as well as um, with um, professional development with leaders we talk about teachers but it also is professional development that leaders are provided at their um, different level meetings. Thank you, um, that was super helpful. So um, at several points when, when um, you and the team were introducing um, some of the changes from when the diagnostics were given, 2022, 2023, versus this year, uh, and I'm not gonna put you on the spot here, Dr. Madrigal, I kinda <laughs> want you to help us. Um, I think you were also cautioning us not to compare 2022 data, 2022 slash 2023 data with this year's data for the very point that you just made because the diagnostics were being, were given at um, different points of time. Um, so I guess my question is, when is it appropriate to look back at 2022, 2023, 23, 24, given that the diagnostics as you just you know, clearly shared were, were um, um, we're given at different uh, points of time. Well, I think, um, and thank you for that question. I think we have to think about when we're measuring this particular goal, it's different um, leading indicators that we've spoken to. This is just one. And so what we will do at the summative um, 
update to the board is that we will look at FERSA data, for example. And when I say promising, we did look at the FERSA data that has come in, and that is looking very positive. <coughs> Obviously, we want to make sure that it's fully complete to be able to share out to the board. So I think it's important to correlate not only this, this assessment to other internal assessments that we provide and look across multiple assessments. One assessment doesn't tell you the whole picture, but when we look at a variety that are measuring similar skills in each of the grade levels, then we can say, this is definitely leading us in the right direction. Yeah, and that was, that was my last question. It would be super helpful. I'm glad, you, and I know your team's already being very strategic and intentional about it, to remind us the importance of correlation across assessments, right? I remember a, a good conversation we were having with AJ when he was here on uh, whether you could get some data on correlation between iReady mm -hmm. uh, diagnostics and SBAC. Uh, yes. data and you brought back and said that you know from the data that was shared there was a strong correlation so it would be good to remind us and refresh our memories on our memories on the correlation across different assessments that we're using thank you for that absolutely and we will do that with our summative data presentation we will bring in some of those correlation points and um, uh, data points that can support that thank you Dr. madrigal very quick question question uh, is this is data uh, for students taking the iReady available, like broken down by ELs, LTELs, um, foster youth, SPET students, and homeless population? Do I we can, have those breakdowns? I can speak to English learners. Okay. Um, I would have to provide an update and go into the system to specifically uh, speak in regards to the other groups and how it's disaggregated. But it does disaggregate in a similar way that we do, as well as other urban districts. But I don't want to misspeak in regards specifically, does it foster youth, does it um, disaggregate? But definitely for language and different ethnic groups, yes. So I can provide that information at a later date. Uh, so my question is going to be actually for David. So, and follow me here. So one of the things that I spoke about uh, some months back was one of my visits uh, over at Lafayette and how I was working with some of our TOSAs and how they literally had a room dedicated to breaking down the academic success of each student and where they are and the interventions that they were receiving, so on and so forth. And so when I think about that exercise, and I was so impressed with it, uh, I think about like this data and how, yes, this is the 50,000 foot macro view of this, but how has this information trickled down all the way down to the campuses, almost to this micro level, to potential, potential classrooms and even to the students? So great question, thank you for that. As uh, Dr. Madrigal um, shared, we do have as a part of our system school-wide where we're looking at the data in the CDS, but we also have our principals who meet with teachers individually. And so a lot of those meetings are called knee to knee meetings, and that's where they're spending time um, talking about the individual progress of students. Where are they? What do, we, what do they need? How do we make sure that we meet their needs? In addition to that, we also have um, our intervention teams as well as our what's referred to as our IICs, our intervention coordinators. Uh, and they are also looking at the individual progress of students doing coaching in classrooms. So we actually have multiple layers of looking at the data, looking at individual students, understanding the needs of our students and making sure that we're meeting their needs. And just for confirmation, so obviously this is a macro view of the entire district. Do, well, do they also receive some form of this type of presentation or what, is that part of the plan going into next year? Just curious. Well, I would love to show you a video of all of our celebrations yesterday at the principal's meeting. And although the data is preliminary, so we can't speak to it yet, I will say that there is lots to celebrate and um, all of the supports that are in place and all of the strategic positions that are in place are all supporting our students and helping us meet goal one and goal two. Are you also asking about school or classroom level reports like this? Yeah, no. yeah, 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 yeah. So as a part of, um, 
I'm just, I don't, as a power, as a part of our system in Power BI, we can drill it all the way down to our classroom level to really look at the individual needs. And there was just a presentation and a tool that is being piloted. Well, I'm not, I won't say I'm sorry, not piloted, but that is being explored with our principals where we're looking at feedback that help each teacher drill down uh, even more with those individual skills and needs. Mr. Zaid, since you're on a roll uh, here, uh, at the micro level, so we often hear from our um, schools about making sure that students sleep well, you know, try to have a meal on, on days that we're assessing. Um, what do conversations with parents, caregivers look like in terms of what to make of iReady uh, scores for individual students? And, and, who, and who has those uh, conversations? That's a that's a, a, a great question. A lot of times those do take place in our conferences in terms of making sure that our parents are aware of the assessments that are being uh, rolled out when those assessment calendars. And for all those uh, parents who are watching online, one of the things that I appreciate about our research uh, office is they provide exactly when the assessments are on our website there is an assessment calendar and so it is meeting with parents and then making sure that they're aware of what specific assessments are going to be given and what they can expect with math or what they can uh, expect with reading that then help them prepare for that yeah and i'm thinking more mr zane maybe this is a dr baker a big question um so i'm a parent I know this iReady is coming up. My student comes home, says I did the iReady. I get the scores. What, what, what do I do uh, with those? Who sort of guides me through what does this mean? Uh, sort of that, that kind of conversation. There are parent level reports that are available that parents can see. It actually shows um, where their child placed in Diagnostic 1. It shows how much growth they would need to make to, in order to be on grade level. Um, and so they're able to access that. It's, it's available in multiple languages so that they can see how what their child needs to do to progress and as the year goes on where they are in that process. <laughs> Maybe I'm not asking. Does, is there any um, need to have a conversation specifically about that with parents? So let, again, let's say I'm a parent, I log on, but again, what, what, like, let's say that my student has not yet met or is not where they should be. How do those conversations occur? Like, what, what happens at that yeah, point? I'll connect back to something Mr. Zaid shared a moment ago. So in, at the elementary level, every year there's an expectation in November that a teacher and the parent meet for a parent conference. So that's an expectation. The teachers make that, all the outreach possible to connect with every parent. Great opportunity to talk about strengths that a child has, for a teacher to learn about the assets that a student's bringing into the classroom, and potentially an opportunity for the teacher to, and the parent to talk about some areas that they can improve together. For students who may be continuing to not be quite on grade level, there's another opportunity come March. And those are for students more at promise that maybe haven't made the growth we would like to see, a follow-up conversation. So those would be the two built into the year opportunities that are throughout the elementary level in particular. I was just going to add that part of Parent University this past year, and maybe Dr. Montregal, you can speak to it, um, there was a support for technology as well as support for accessing things that a parent might want to access so that they're equipped even beyond the school level if they're wondering, you know, what can I ask, who can I talk to, how do I read that report, that was part of this year's series, which can always be improved and we can always um, hope that more, plan for more parents to be there, but do you want to comment about some of that support? Sure, that I was going to also, thank you, I will I'll also add that some of our different departments um, through, for example, example, um, some of the partnering with some of the level offices, some of our parent facilitators uh, also received training from the research uh, department um, in January and several months after in regards to how can we um, engage parents in multiple languages using some of the resources that are provided through um, Curriculum Associates, who is, um, they are the um, owners of iReady. And um, not only just giving the reports, because there's something about not only giving the report, uh, we, we as a district definitely, um, through the research department, we share the reports via the different means, whether email, reminders, but there's something to be said about like being able to sit down with a parent. Um, and so some of the work that we've done with parent facilitators is to really help them 
to um, empower parents to be able to ask questions regarding like what does target growth mean and um, when we have different conferences like the type of questions uh, that parents can ask so that there's an entry point for the parent or caregivers so there has been some collaboration across um, not only level offices but also uh, in partnership with dr salazar um, with her office to be able to Almost that trainer of trainers, our, our folks in research go out, help other departments uh, with the goal of having them in the different spaces that they're in share that information because we understand that that is very powerful. It does make me think about another idea, which is thinking about our back to school communications and adding something around the assessment processes that students um, engage in as the school year starts to the kind of messaging and information that we provide at back to school time. So I'll add that to our idea list. Yeah. Uh, just to kind of wrap everything up, one of the things that uh, we have been talking about as a board is really the cascading, that was the fancy term Dr. Baker was using in regards to our board goals all the way down to the classroom. And so one of the things that uh, was really the center of my questions was making sure that the community understands that the conversations that are are happening with your daughter or your son on their performance in iReady or on the SBAC are literally trickling all the way up to the uh, board and we're having these conversations and I would hope that the conversations that we're having are also being shared with you too. Okay, do we have any um, other comments or questions? If I may, I President Craig, just kind of oh. to, to wrap up, and thank you, Dr. Madrigal. Um, so we will continue this summer, as you heard Dr. Madrigal reference. In August, we will be coming back following the progress monitoring calendar that you all adopted. We will be doing our summative look at data for this entire school year that will be um, related to our board goals, but also taking a more holistic look on student outcomes. And then we'll be back in in September. We'll have some final grades, and we can go back and do a board goals three and four at that time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, next we have uh, new business. 16.1 is adoption of our budget for 2024-2025. Move to approve. Second. Uh, discussion? Uh, I do have a question. Oh, okay, yes. Um, so um, I'm referring here to page five, um, our unduplicated pupil um, count. So just the background information, given that um, we always reference how important our unduplicated pupil count is for both budget but also planning, and given that we have in general experienced uh, as has been showed in many, many of the graphs and charts, um, student enrollment decline. Just kind of wondering what the rationale is for years 24, 25 out that we're using the same, the 64.98%, rather than projecting out that 2 to 3% ongoing loss of students, uh, Ms. Takahashi. Yeah, we're, we are just um, projecting that we'll in a sense, um, maintain the same level of effort in terms of identification of our unduplicated students. And so we're just projecting the same um, percentage out with the, with the same declining enrollment and projecting the same percentage out. Okay, um, so I wanted to make sure of that because yeah. I think at some points, and it's, it's been really hard, right? One, to be precise in our unduplicated student count, but um, I guess the big question and, and it may not be answerable tonight, but are we losing, losing uh, through declining enrollments, more unduplicated students than our overall uh, declining enrollments, uh, Ms. Takashi? Yes, well, our, um, the past has shown that, yeah. that we are losing, there, that marks a demographic shift, I would yeah. say. But in terms of projecting or having a basis for projecting that moving forward, it's very, very challenging. Yeah. So at this time, we're just pro projecting the same percentage okay. amount. Yeah. Uh, I mean, again, still expecting that we, we, unless something happens beyond our control, we're, we're going to continue experiencing decline in enrollments. Correct. Okay. Correct. Thank you. 
uh, I just Ms. have Lopez. a question. We did have a couple of speakers earlier, um, and one of the questions that they asked was, uh, what would be different, what is different, um, what will be different for EL students um, and specific to the, to the LCAP and the budget? So we're on the budget approval, not the LCAP. I don't know if you want to wait and ask the question. Um, so do we have any uh, further discussion on the budget? Um, I'll just add that I appreciate having the highlights and the information that's included <clears throat> that provides context and kind of an overview. It, it makes it um, more uh, easy to understand, and and I and I do appreciate that context because when you're looking at a budget, it's more than just <clears throat> the the revenues and um, what what is projected to be spent. I'll just add that the memo that you all have has been posted publicly on with the board I, or the board docs item, so it's available for members of the public, and thank you for recognizing the exceptional work of the team under Ms. Takahashi's direction. They have thought of many ways to communicate a very complicated um, set of facts and figures that go into creating uh, the district budget. Yeah. Thank you for adding that. Okay, um, unless there's any further discussion, then we will have our board secretary take a roll call vote. <coughs> thank you. Member Lopez? Aye. Member Otto? Aye. President Craighead? Aye. Member Benitez? Aye. And Member Miller? Aye. That passes 5-0. Thank you. Next we have item 16.2, adoption of the 2024-2025 Local Control and Accountability Plan, otherwise known as our LCAP. <laughs> Move for approval. Second. And discussion. Now my question, same one I asked. Uh, will we, what will be different for EL students um, is part of the, the plan in the LCAP? So I don't know if a member of the team wants to speak specifically to that. Um, I think what the member of the public shared is one part of a extensive plan. So Jim or Viva, do you want to speak to that? So um, obviously I invite my colleagues. Um, well, first of all, let's just do a higher level view. Um, one of the big things that we're looking at is a goal specifically targeting our EL and our LTELs. In this case, shining that flashlight of equity on students who have been historically marginalized is a huge change because it holds ourselves accountable. I will also um, say that the metrics that we have developed for LTELs and um, English learners are um, very specific and very bold, shall I say. Um, more specifically for our um, LTELs, we have on page 72 specifically a list of some highlights um, that we have not had in the past in terms of displaying it to our public as well as um, if you look at the page 71 it continues for English learners and newcomers there are some areas here that are new um, but I would say that and I, I think I talked a little bit more about this in our last conversation which is really focusing a lot of attention on our QCI and our designated and our implementation of strong designated um, and integrated ELD in our classrooms, especially in our secondary schools. That in itself, although not new and although doesn't come with a, a budget here in the LCAP, um, the professional development, the strong focus on that, I think is going to be a, um, let me just say, I think it's promising. Um, because the more that we um, focus on that type of strong instruction in classrooms 
for our EL students and our long-term EL students, especially in the secondary schools, I think we're going to find ourselves in um, uh, reducing these bold um, gaps that we have in our metrics. Let's more specifically, what you asked was some, some new I, um, items, and I would call your attention to page 72 and, well, 71 and 72. What the LCAP also doesn't provide the opportunity to do is to have, as has been in the past, a presentation by Dr. Lund and the multilingual office team that tells you more about what is taught in the professional learning experiences, the monitoring that takes place in terms of English learners and their programmatic experiences at the schools and how redesignation criteria is used in monitoring progress. So that's something that we could certainly bring back. Um, we've had several presentations in the past, but not of recent. So it may be a, a way to explore that topic further. Yeah, I can build a little bit on what Dr. Baker shared as well as what uh, Jim shared. All of our teachers this coming year will have a full day training around designated ELD. That did not actually happen this year. This year we focused on integrated ELD. So next year there'll be um, all of our TK to five teachers will have a full day on designated ELD. All of our secondary English teachers, including CCR, advanced ELD, course teachers will have a full day as well on designated ELD. We've revised the secondary sequence for our English learners. So there is a required course now that we implemented this year that will continue at the middle school level next year for English learners that have not reclassified, that are not at the, what we call the well-developed stage. So if they're at the beginning or somewhat to moderately developed in their English language skills, they will be automatically placed in an additional English course in middle school what's uh, titled as CCR, a college career readiness course. And then at the high school level, we are introducing two new courses. So our students that are not, that haven't reclassified in high school will go into advanced ELD in ninth grade. In 10th grade, they will go into that new world history ELD course that you approved tonight. And then in 11th grade, they'll go into the global art studies ELD course. So all three of these high school courses are specifically designed for English learners to improve their language skills, to move them to reclassification. So in the past, they have not been required to take a second course. Moving forward, all secondary English learners in grades six through 11 are required to take a second English course specifically designed for English learners. So, um I know that there are tens of thousands of people that are watching this tonight, and there are probably hundreds of thousands that will be watching it in the weeks to come. So could you tell us what ELDs are, because I don't think they know. ELD stands for English Language Development, okay. and it's specifically a course, in this case, a course designed to support our English learners who have not reclassified. Okay. And reclassification is the process by which, according to exams, uh, including iReady results, including the state's LPAC result, which is the primary indicator, right. and then a secondary indicator, either iReady, SBAC, teacher recommendation, and then parent notification mm -hmm. for full reclassification. Yeah. Okay. Is that clear? Um, so I appreciated the memo that accompanied this version three, um, and, and again, just props for putting all this uh, together. Um, is, is the memo available publicly as well, Dr. Baker? As soon as a member of the public um, clicks on draft three, the information from the memo is there for okay, them. Okay, it's great. And I just kind of wanted to highlight because in the memo, it does highlight that there are some slight, but yet there are differences. Um, and so I wanted to ask a question about one of the differences. So it's the last bullet point on the memo. Um, bullet point, increased improved services for foster youth, English learners, and low-income students. So it's noted that the amount of the district's uh, concentration grant was um, higher than expected. Pa I'm now I'm referring to page 129. And uh, in addition, the percentage of increased improved services was also higher to slightly over, I think, 19%. So just some background. It does, is, does that 19 percent correlate to the increase in the amount of funds, or where, where did 
How did that 19% appear uh, in version three? Well, I'm gonna start and I'll have uh, my colleague Renee, who's the expert on this, uh, okay. go in a little more detail. Um, first of all, let me answer the second question, which is the 19%. That is um, above what we're supposed to be doing in terms of a ratio, so that's really good news. However, I, I wouldn't characterize this as a influx of money, per se. I would characterize this more of an accounting calculation change, an accounting calculation change. When we have our uh, um, conferences with our partners at LACO, they talk to us a lot about the tables and uh, the uh, finance pieces of that. And a lot of times the the way that they are calculating or the way they want us to present it in the LCAP is slightly different than what we have done in the past. So for example, LACO? this- LACO? Yes, LACO, our county office of education. Okay. LACO um, stands for and so LA in our, office of education. I'm sorry? Yeah. yeah. I just, oh, our Los Angeles County Office of Education. Yeah, it's for the- LACO. The so we, um, we, we do have conversations with them often. They do provide some um, pre-review <coughs> of some of our drafts, and they will also be providing us um, a post-review of our drafts during the summer, and we are in con constant contact with them regarding um, non-material changes, typically. Um, and this is one of the changes that we had made between um, the draft two and draft three. Would you like to... That was it? Oh, wow. Uh, but you lost me. I don't know. I, I know. That. What is an account? What did you call it? An accounting something It is change? an accounting calculation change. What is that? Rather than a budget change. <laughs> see, now, see, she thought she was done, but no. And, and again, the question is, um, you know, after Renee, sorry, uh, Ms. Arcus, um, sort of walks us through what that technical term means, um, the, the question was more, and I don't know if you got to it, uh, Mr. Suarez, how did, where does this 19.1% uh, in increase in services come, come from, if it's an accounting change, okay. not a budget change? And it's props because you're telling us what, I would, not, I would never have found that <laughs> if it were not for the memo that said there's a difference uh, here. So the 19% rep, rep, represents the total percentage to increase or improve services for the coming school year. So it's talking about the percent, and it's based on dollars, and that's why that's, okay. it comes to this kind of calculation and a discussion between LA County Office of Ed and ourselves. And so what there was, there was a small, um, difference of opinion between our small, our uh, percentage of our concentration grant. And um, we went ahead and adjusted the number that we had presented in year in uh, draft two into draft three to match LACO's um, dollar amount that they provided. And therefore that landed the percentage a little higher. It actually improved that percentage of services that we're offering. It didn't change the overarching dollars in the LCAP at all. A difference of opinion, we're calling it, Ms. Arcus. <laughs> that was the polite way. <laughs> uh, so the projected difference of opinion was up 15 percent, you know, roughly, not more, but and but the increase in improved services is a 19 percent. Well, prior in draft two, I yeah. think it was about 18 okay. percent, and it went up. It went up to 19 percent, yeah. and the difference of opinion between the accountants among us was about two hundred thousand okay. dollars. Uh, and this is a good thing for our district? This doesn't change what our district did as a whole. Like everything that we presented in the LCAP stayed. All of the dollars that we are utilizing for these services stayed. This is just a presentation regarding the amount of services that we're increasing because of the slight difference in opinion between our number and their number. It appears that we are actually providing additional percentage of services. Which sounds to me like a good thing. <laughs> Okay, We're, yeah. additional yes. services. Yeah. Yes, okay. Clear, thank you. <laughs> See, I read these memos that you all uh, provide for us. I do have another question. Um, are we increasing the number of counselors in this plan? I 
give me a one moment, please, because I think I have the information. So our projection amount of counseling FTE is 143.1, and last year at in the year 2023-24, it was 130.6, which makes a a little bit less than a 13, uh, 13 FTE increase. Would you happen to know what the student teacher ratio would that look like? Say it one more time. Student teacher ratio. I don't have the student teacher ratio for the counseling versus enrollment, but I do have the uh, overall mental health provider, which we, which we, um, when we, when we talk about ratios and services for, um, students, we look at a holistic view because there's more than just a counselor at school sites to be able to help with um, um, mental health issues or questions or concerns. So we, in our holistic view, uh, the counselor, psychologist, social worker, um, and total FTEs went from last year at 243, 243.8, this, this coming year is 254.6 which gives our mental health provider to student ratio at 246.1. But you don't have just the counselors. Uh, I'd have to make that calculation, but I do not have it with me, no. Jim, in addition to that, we are adding seven new counselor positions out of our grant that we recently received. When you talk about mental health workers, those include social workers, psychologists, uh, and anybody else? And counselors. And, and, and counselors, that's yes. what I meant, in addition to uh, the counselors. Because they perform those same mental health functions, right? Not the same, but similar additive. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't say that they're same functions as much right. as I would say the supports that can be provided for students in terms of mental health concerns would be captured by th these three types of um, professionals. Mm -hmm. So, and the addition of these counselors plus these other mental health professionals is in the face of deficit spending that, that we're now in, right? That is correct. Okay. Um, I would also like to thank the team for providing the budget overview for parents. I found that to be um, <clears throat> uh, very easy to read and understand, and it, it, it explains um, some some basic um, functions of of the budget of LCAP, what's where and and why, and um, I like that. I also appreciate on the um, memo about the minor changes that we are really making an effort to spell out acronyms because if we truly want this to be a document that's accessible to our community partners, parents, stakeholders, we really need to make it um, as easy as possible to read and understand. So I appreciate that effort to, um, to make sure that the acronyms are, are spelled out. And, and even when we're having these discussions, it's, it's, it's a good idea, I think, to, um, to limit the use of acronyms, or at least if we're gonna use them to, to uh, kind of say them in the long version at some point, just so that people can follow along. I, I know <clears throat> as a, well, a long time ago, but as a new parent to the district, it was hard when you're attending a meeting to follow along if everybody's just speaking an acronym. So I appreciate that effort and think that that would be very helpful in having our community partners, you know, understand um, what we're doing. Uh, any, yes, Dr. Benitez. Just final words, um, President Craighead. I, I, I just want to continue encouraging our community members to uh, keep providing input, keep engaging uh, with us, and, and I would expand it. And it's not that it's not important to hear from our community members um, the month of uh, LCAP approval um, and, and even weeks before. Um, and I'm speaking candidly here. Uh, I want to continue encouraging our district to provide opportunities throughout the budget engagement process. 
uh, because ultimately it's in alignment with these priorities, right, that were identified. Uh, and, and as proud as we are of the 2,000 plus uh, respondents, um, I think we can do more as a district, right? Be very intentional about what spaces we're at, where we meet community, and to keep highlighting for community how important it is that we do lift up um, their voices through these priorities. Uh, because just as we got 2,000, let's be quite frank, if 2,000 people told us there was an 11th priority or a 10th priority, it would probably be reflected here. It's just hard, right, in the, in the last month uh, when we have to uh, approve uh, this, to see some of these voices. So I think it's an it's a opportunity for us to uh, expand on our budget engagement process, uh, for us as board members to remind community members, hey, if you're at DCAC, if you're at DLAC, um, there's gonna be a budget engagement survey uh, there. If you're at, um, what were some of the other spaces, Mr. Suarez? I know um, there was dozens and dozens of, of, sure. of opportunities. Sure, Sankofa, CAC, Sankofa, yes. I mean. CAC, so uh, good good reminder for us that if, if we're not seeing sort of what we think our priorities, whether that's a school community, neighborhoods, specific parts of our district, that I think we, we, we can do more, we should do more, and for our community to not think this is the end all, be all, just because something wasn't in here on this one document, that there's still a lot of stuff that can be done locally at your school site, and that the budget engagement process is more than just approving or adopting a budget in June, uh, right? So thank you for the hard work. And, and I, I can appreciate that, and I just wanna bounce one other thing, because I, I, wanna, I wanna remind um, all of us that the, what the intentionality of aligning the different strategic plans, the different goals that we have in many of these plans helps ensure more understanding to a very complex 140 page document where when we talk about board goals, we are talking about the LCAP. When we talk about superintendent's goals, we are talking about the LCAP. And those that intentionality of alignment really I think can bring clarity so that when we are talking about one thing, we are talking about this document, we're talking about strategic planning, we're talking about vision, we're talking about board goals, we're talking about LCFF goals. So I think that's a really important, trying to be much more specific and clear in clarity. I wanna amplify your point as well, Dr. Benitez. Um, there is an LCAP summary that also can be clicked on from the same place as the LCAP itself that summarizes expenditures. And 7.2 uh, in that summary is almost $10 million that are allocated to school sites. And so your point is incredibly important. When school reopens and parents are thinking about what are the services, what are the enrichments and interventions that meet the needs of our local community, that is absolutely a place to become involved. They're under the goal of equitable and liberatory district, which means that it's not someone else deciding for a school community what can best serve the students. It is actually um, placing the funds as the community held as a priority to have funds that it decides on how to use those funds. So really important that this is not a, a one-time thing in approving a budget. It's really, as we've said before, a 12-month experience, taking feedback, including that the um, feedback that was given today and questions that have been asked about if you're not having tutoring in the LCAP, where does it go? It's instructive and it helps us to just think about ongoing communication, but really want to amplify that families um, should feel um, empowered to be involved at the school level because there are many decisions to be made with that $10 million. Okay. Um, let, me, uh, let me just amplify that just a little bit and say that with the strategic planning process that we've been going through, both the outreach for the last year and a half and now the actual planning process, um, we've, com we've communicated and created uh, not only student voice, but community <laughs> voice. And um, now that we're giving them opportunities to do exactly what uh, Superintendent Baker is suggesting, which is to become involved. Uh, historically, the school site councils were places where there was a lot of opportunities for input. and. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's the philosophy of the strategic plan that what we're doing is we're trying to involve everybody in this decision making. Thank you. 
Um, unless there's no further discussion, uh, I will ask our board secretary to take a roll call vote. Thank you. Member Lopez? Aye. Member Otto? Aye. President Craighead? Aye. Member Benitez? Aye. And Member Miller? Aye. That passes 5-0. Thank you. And now item 16.3, approval of general counsel employment contract. Move approval. Second. Um, discussion, well, sure. Um, I'm pleased to make a recommendation for the position of general counsel after an extensive and robust recruitment and interview process. This position will continue Mr. Strumfer's management of the district's legal functions. Staff has selected and recommends for approval Jeffrey Riel as general counsel. Prior to the board's consideration of the recommended approval of the employment agreement for the general counsel and in alignment with government code section 54953C3, I will announce the following summary of salary and fringe benefits set forth in the proposed general counsel employment agreement between Long Beach Unified School District and Jeffrey Riel. The contract term is effective July 15th, 2024 through July 14th, 2026. Mr. Riel will receive an annual salary of $283,645, which is within range for the classification established by the Personnel Commission, effective July 15th, 2024. Percentage salary increases provided to Mr. Riel will not be less than those granted by the governing board to any other non-representative manager or bargaining unit member of the district during the term of this contract, including but not limited to any retroactive salary increase approved by the board for the 2024-25 school year. <coughs> Mr. Riel will receive paid medical benefits on the same terms as other management employees. Mr. Riel will receive district paid life insurance with a death benefit of $50,000. The district will cover the premium for additional life insurance in an amount not to exceed $500,000, provided the annual cost does not exceed $3,250. Mr. Riel will, will earn 22.06 working days of annual vacation with pay exclusive of holidays and 13.26 days of sick leave annually. The district shall provide a monthly stipend of $350 for a vehicle allowance. With that in mind, staff recommends that the board approve the employment agreement with Jeffrey Riel as general counsel. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any further discussion? I'll have our board secretary take a roll call vote. Member Lopez? Aye. Member Otto? Aye. President Craighead? Aye. Member Benitez? Aye. Member Miller? Aye. Thank you, that passes 5-0. Thank you. Um, we are also missing a student board member because it is summer and, well, school's out. So, Mr. Miller, we will start with you. Okay, well, I will be very brief. Uh, Dr. Benitez already touched on it, but I wanted to also uh, co-sign and thank all of our graduates, or send a big congratulations to all of our graduates. We had over 5,000, right? What's the exact number? 5,039. 5,039? 5,039? There we go. Well. Uh, I had the opportunity to go to three different graduations. Uh, I have jokingly <coughs> said that I have cousins all throughout the city of Long Beach. Uh, if uh, I joke about that, but in reality, there are a lot of people that I consider family. Though there might not be the same blood lineage, I love them just the same. And so uh, it was a privilege to be able to attend uh, numerous graduations throughout the district as they were just fantastic. I think it's, uh, uh, I quote it and called it uh, the most, um, my favorite time of the year. And so uh, it was fantastic. And so I just wanted to send a big congratulations to all of our graduates for 2024. And uh, welcome to the LBUSD Alumni Club. Uh, uh, to that, I spoke to um, uh, my love for the city of Long Beach and how there's a sense of family with folks that may not necessarily be within my same bloodlines, uh, but in the same token, I love them all the same. And I felt that in abundance at this year's Juneteenth event over at Rainbow Lagoon. Uh, for anyone who was able to attend, uh, I think it was another beautiful, beautiful event. Uh, I think he had a little bit shorter than 10,000 attendees. Um, uh, had a fantastic uh, performer this year. 
uh, you know, those in the hip hop community know him as Pee Wee. But uh, <laughs> uh, but all things considered, they had um, uh, just tons of uh, fun and Soul Train line and uh, good food. And um, I could not be more proud of uh, Carl and the team who put on this year's uh, uh, Juneteenth event and for the Long Beach Unified School District to be involved. Um, like I said earlier, this is a family event, and so there's uh, thousands of families that show up to this event with their kids. I had uh, both my daughter and EJ uh, uh, hanging out with us, even got to take some cool photos with Anderson Pack, right? Um, uh, but uh, all things considered, it was, once again, uh, a beautiful celebration of love, of family, and uh, uh, it is a great way to mark and acknowledge uh, the Emancipation Proclamation of 1865 or 1862, and then it didn't even get fully acknowledged until 1865, but that's a totally different topic. Uh, all things considered, it was a... Uh, once again, a very, very great event, and I wanted to congratulate all of the volunteers that helped put on the event. I don't know uh, if uh, any of you were able to attend, but one of the things that was pretty cool, as you probably saw, there was a couple of LBUSD uh, employees uh, and parents who were part of the volunteer team. Uh, so we had folks ranging from uh, Mr. Evans from YBS, he was working the cameras, and we had some folks working as ushers. Um, it was, uh, once again, just awesome to see not only uh, the great event, but the LBUSD influence and being a part of uh, um, the Juneteenth history. So, once again, just a big thank you, big shout out to everybody who participated, as uh, it was, once again, a fantastic event. That's all for my report. Thank you, Dr. Benitez. Thank you, Mr. Miller. So Carl Kemp did it again. Oh, did That's great. Yeah. That's great. Uh, and I think we should devote some time to uh, re-sharing that historically there was an Emancipation Proclamation, but in places like Texas, it was years later. All uh, right, years later. So thank you, Mr. Miller. Um, I do want to, I'll just share a couple uh, things tonight. So uh, Taub had its end of year uh, celebration and uh, an award. Uh, ceremony, um, you know, celebrating our teachers. Uh, you know, throughout the year, uh, at our at our meetings, we get a chance to uh, acknowledge and congratulate retire retirees. Um, we had a good time, uh, right, uh, at the top celebration, and it's 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 always good to end in these moments of graduations, celebrations, uh, and acknowledging, uh, right, all the all the wonderful stuff that goes on uh, across our district and across our city. So, um, you know, big, big thank you for the invitation to uh, Taub and to all the work uh, that they did to put that celebration together. Um, I also um, had an opportunity along with um, Dr. Baker, President Craighead, and, and a few other folks from our district um, to participate in uh, Kamai Parent Association's scholarship uh, programs uh, ceremony, super powerful event, um, hopefully, uh, Madam President, you, you'll, you'll add to that, but just, you know, can't celebrate all the work that, uh, I'm gonna say it, Chan Hobson and, and KPA and all the other organizations that support the scholarship. They got a commitment for three years of funding from Cambodian Association of America for continuing scholarships. And um, one of the many things that stood out to me uh, Saturday um, is that the awards are going to all students across of our district. Right, the scholarship money is going to all students from different backgrounds uh, and different parts of our entire district. So a wonderful event uh, by uh, any measure, any account. The last thing I'll say is um, most of our graduates, um, in some way or another, either through their valedictorian speeches or through interaction uh, with the graduates, um, reference that they started um, virtually. Um, and it wasn't that long ago that we um, were not able to celebrate uh, graduates. And we heard from a lot of folks that were not happy uh, with that, went for, for a bunch of different reasons. 
Uh, but these students from this cohort of graduates started school remotely, right? And talked about the unique uh, challenges and obstacles. Unique's a good word for it. That they encountered, all right? In, in, in the midst of a global pandemic, uh, with all the uncertainty and uh, lives that were taken, um, that this group of, of graduates has um, so much more to be proud of because of this unknowing starting a quote unquote high school experience or a pathway to high school experience, particularly um, for the graduates of our, and, and I don't wanna say this in a way that's diminishing uh, the, the, the celebration that should have occurred all across our district, but particularly at places like um, EPHS, um, these themes were highlighted, uh, right, where, where students spoke eloquently about how tough it had been, but um, if it had not been for EPHS, they would not have completed their graduation requirements. For the uh, beautiful celebration at our ACT program uh, over at Tucker, and, and again, I, 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 I'm not suggesting that other celebrations should receive less recognition, but I wanted to highlight uh, that all of these students that graduated this year started off with so much uncertainty in their lives, and that 5,039 is going to change the world, Mr. Miller, because of those experiences. That's my report. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because that was a recurring theme, and there were a lot of challenges that had to be overcome. Uh, Mr. Otto. Great. Thanks. So I want to uh, <coughs> underline, like uh, the other speakers have, how important this time of year is for us and what a great... Uh, great uh, uh, thing, you, you go to these graduations and it just puts you in the mood for celebrating what a special thing we have with public education uh, in Long Beach. Um, I did, I started off very busy uh, and uh, back from a granddaughter's graduation up at the University of Washington and raced back and uh, did the Sato graduation, and uh, that's always a, the, one of my favorite uh, graduations. It is such an important, interesting, uh, enthusiastic school, and uh, that got me in the mood for moving on to, uh, I did um, Tincher, and I did Wilson, and uh, I, uh, I, I think I may have mentioned before I came home from the uh, Wilson uh, graduation where I believe I shook 500 hands or uh, pretty close to it and uh, uh, very enthusiastic and said to my wife, that was great. And she said one thing, you know what it was? Wash your hands. You wash my hands, and, of course. And, uh, and uh, I didn't and, uh, and then I did because I knew that, uh, that I had to do that. But uh, um, then, um, um, to Wilt Wilson and uh, Tincher, and then uh, the one that is unforgettable to me whenever I do this is that I did Avalon. And this was uh, a very special year to do Avalon because uh, the principal, Emma Piguero, uh was not only the principal at the graduation of 38 Avalon students, but she was also the fourth grade teacher of all those students. And I, I think I called uh, uh, Dr. Baker uh, when I came back from that and I said, where else is there that you can go to a graduation where the, gradu where the principal is also the teacher of all the, all the graduates in the fourth grade? I got one for you. I went to a graduation where the principal of the school was also a student for the superintendent. Oh, yeah. yeah, her she had her first graduation in Principal Knock, and so yeah. she was a student. Well, or, yeah. the, to to see the looks on the faces of these uh, of these Avalon graduates uh, at when the when the principal would give them their uh, diplomas was uh, unforgettable because it was a lifetime, really a lifetime of uh, doing that. And that's special about uh, this district. And, uh, 
and uh, it's unduplicated anywhere else that I that uh, I know of. And so that was great. I stayed uh, overnight to have breakfast with the faculty, the 28 faculty members that were there, and uh, they were very enthusiastic about. Uh, uh, about the presence of the district uh, by by uh, Brian and I going over for the for the graduation, but uh, just what's going on over there and the principal I think is doing a great job and uh, uh, and, uh, and is very supported. So uh, so that that's really what my story is. It's it's kind of winding down now. The gra we're, we've finished this. Uh, uh, this season, and there's a lot of stuff to do educationally over the summer, but uh, we now have a, uh, a budget that we've uh, adopted, and uh, we've communicated to people what it is that we're doing, what our values are. We've got a strategic plan and process, and uh, uh, it's, uh, it's been a good year. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Lopez. Thank you. I'll be brief. Uh, so I attended Jordan High School's graduation ceremony, and boy, it was beautiful. <coughs> Student board member Axel uh, was one of the speakers, and he, along with the other two speakers, were just so outstanding. Um, what an honor for me to have been a part of this special day. Um, and I also want to just take a moment and thank the educators and the administrators for their hard work this year. And I especially like to thank one of our principals, Sophia Griffith, uh, for the incredible difference she made at Muir Elementary School. Her hard work, her vision, and her commitment created a positive learning environment for students and staff at the school. Uh, her leadership, her dedication, and her unwavering support to Muir's community truly helped transform the school. Uh, her impact on the school was very profound. Um, she not only shaped the academic environment, but also fostered a culture of kindness, growth, and excellence. Ms. Griffith's leadership set a high bar, and she made a difference in the faculty and the students there. Um, and Ms. Griffith, wherever you are, I know you're still here, and I know you haven't left um, LBUSD, and you'll continue on. But uh, thank you for raising the bar at this school and, and for leading with passion, with commitment, with integrity, and professionalism. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm going to start out with uh, an event that took place at Holmes Elementary in Lakewood. And um, they had a night at the market event. And it was kind of um, an end of the year event for the elementary kids. It was a way for the students to be involved and express their heritage and culture and so um, if you can imagine they had it set up where it was kind of different vendors um, in a corner of the uh, playground and i i spoke to kids um, <clears throat> that were filipino um, i forget all the all the different um, ethnicities but but they had their own booth and each booth had either food or they gave a report, they had their Chromebooks, and they would tell you all about um, the, the country of their heritage. And um, it was such a pleasure just to speak with the kids and to ask them about, you know, are, are these foods that you have in your home or are you just reporting on these foods that you, you know, found online that are associated with this country? And it was great to interact with them and get them kind of off their script a little and, and um, expand on things. There was great music. There, there were dance presentations. Um, there was a Polynesian dance presentation, ballet, folklorico. There were some other things. Very fun, I have to say. The teachers at homes do some really fabulous things with their kids, whether it's uh, a STEAM night or, um, or science or, or whatever. They do a lot of very fun, hands-on things I know that the kids will remember and, and hold with them. And then um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the renaming of the auditorium at Longfellow for Mr. James Petrie. And that was a fabulous event. One of the things I appreciated about that event was that, you know, each of our schools um, has their own culture, their own traditions, and 
it's it's nice to be on a school site and those traditions have continued through the years, through the decades even. And at Longfellow, they have a tradition of the uh, flag ceremony. I think it's weekly on Friday. And they, they also had different traditions that were uh, brought about by Mr. Petrie, the songs and everything. And it was such uh, a, a sweet and sincere event uh, with the kids, you know, singing, with the teachers. See, I think at one point, we were all singing at one point. Mr. Moskovitz is a former Longfellow principal and was there to um, also honor Mr. Petrie. And um, <clears throat> fabulous way, uh, you know, to honor him. And, and he, um, uh, well, actually, one of the things that, that um, you, you brought up, Mr. Moskowitz, about Mr. Petrie, it's not just about music for him, but he's such a good teacher. He could teach anything. And you really uh, get the sense that he just, he just he loves teaching. He loves a kid. So that was a wonderful event. Uh, let's see. And then also, yeah, all the graduations. Um, it's such a, a, a wonderful way to celebrate the culmination of, of, the, of the school year. And uh, the uh, KPA graduation was wonderful. I don't remember how many students were involved, but, but it used to be scholarships were provided for the um, Cambodian students, but they did open it up to um, Asian students in the district. And I believe it was the 30th anniversary celebration of, of this event. So um, so Ms. Chan Hopson and the KPA, which is the um, Kumai Parent Association, They've been uh, acknowledging high school graduates with scholarships for 30 years now. Mm -hmm. 30 years, it's so incredible. She started off with 25, remember? She said that she gave $25 to the first. Uh, she so. gave $25, I, I don't remember what it's up to now. What, what was that amount? I, I don't, I'm sorry to interrupt your report, no, but, that's but, fine. I, but I that's thought fine. it was so um, telling of this community event that she said that she fundraised for $25 that first yeah. year and that that student accepted that as if it was which it was you know more money uh, back then yeah. but you know so from 25 to well uh cambodian association of america donated ten thousand dollars every year for the next three years yeah yeah so in incredible uh support from uh miss chan hobson the kpa and then the the um the ACT uh, graduation, that's our, that's our program. I, I don't know if I ever remember this correctly, but adult community transition, did I get that right? Okay, um, <clears throat> I have a hard time with um, acronyms. And so that was our 22-year-old uh, special ed graduates. Very fun event, very um, wonderful to share with everybody. And um, you, you come away with a special feeling when you experience that. And then I wanted to highlight the fact that we had 26 Browning students <coughs> that graduated at Long Beach City College because our 26 Browning stu students earned their AA degree and walked um, at the Long Beach City College graduation. So that was a big deal. They did that before they walked in their own Browning graduation ceremony. So yeah, congratulations to those students. So that means they're graduating with a high school diploma and an AA degree. So they can go right into their junior year at a four-year school if they choose or pursue something else. It's, it's an incredible boost. Um, a relief financially as far as if you're thinking college tuition that's two years two years that taken care of incredible um, and I know that was a lot of extra work on their part so uh, congratulations to them the Millican graduation for principal Alejandro Vega that was his final Millican graduation he's moving to a different school but also special because his son was graduating that day, so that was very, um, <clears throat> that was uh, very sweet as well. And then at the Lakewood graduation, the graduates 
the, uh, this year's graduates received over $40 million in scholarship money. Wow. $40 million, I believe that's what was reported in, in the principal's um, speech. That's, that's an incredible amount. And then our Long Beach School for Adults had um, over 150 graduates this year, which I believe is pretty as a high number, I think. I don't know, according to uh, my memory, which I don't think we should rely on that, but it just seemed like a lot. Um, and over 100 of those students participated in the graduation at Long Beach City College, um, and that was also a wonderful event. And I think very meaningful because these are people who left school for whatever reason and had to work that much harder to come back and complete a high school diploma. And I give them credit because you can do the equivalency um, test and get your, is it H set? Uh, high set? I knew it started with an H. And, and they, they didn't, they worked and got a high school diploma. And then at McBride, it was also Principal uh, Gonzalo Moraga's uh, final McBride graduation because he's also moving on with a different position. And then of course our EPHS um, uh, graduation, that's our independent study. Um, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's an alternative school. I know we have alternative and continuation. EPHS, that's alternative, right? Okay. Get, sorry? Read. Read is continuation, right. I knew we, l listen, I had a 50-50 chance on that one. Um, so congratulations to all our graduates. And then also I want to mention that the city of Long Beach is offering uh, their annual free summer food service program. Ages 1 through 18 uh, are eligible, and it's now through August 23rd. It's offered at 25 different parks. And for more information, you can go to longbeach.gov forward slash park and I thought that was um, good to mention because I don't want to think of kids hungry don't we make the food dr. Baker well you know what let me pass it on to dr. Baker and she can just take it from here they do contract with us for some of the food and our students can receive meals in their summer program as well on our school campuses so I'll just highlight that I'm going to seed my superintendent's report to our students tonight and I'd like to suggest President Craighead that you close or adjourn the meeting in honor of our students and that we share the wonderful um, video that our marketing and media team created um, of our students all over the city of Long Beach at their graduations. That was very hard work for the team behind the scenes who um, just did a fabulous job highlighting the successes of our students and the joy of families and students at graduation. So with that in mind, I'll pass it back to you for adjournment. Okay, so um, without uh, any objection, we will adjourn this meeting. Our next regularly scheduled meeting is July 17th. Um, so we will direct our attention to the screen and watch the video of our wonderful graduates. Oh.